rail lovers, welcome to Railways Explained. As we promised in one of the previous videos, today we will try to explain one global initiative that we believe most of you have already heard of, the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. As you probably know, there are many different videos and articles on this topic, but as always we will try not to only repeat them, but in addition to provide you with a completely new aspect the aspect of railway traffic within the Belt and Road Corridors. First, we will try to explain what this initiative is, the reasons behind China's decision to launch it at first place, and then we will stick to the role and the potential of railway traffic within the context of this initiative. Fasten your seat belts, because you are about to watch another interesting video on Railways Explained. Historically speaking, the exchange of people and goods between Europe and Asia is nothing new. It dates even before the establishment of the famous Silk Road during the period of Han Dynasty. Since then, Europe and China are engaged in almost constant cultural interaction, especially in exchange of products such as porcelain, silk, seasoning, paper and tea. This exchange, or better said trade, was later only improved during the time of the Mongol Empire, which, with its centralized influence and territorial coverage, contributed to the existence and control of trade routes at much larger scale. These economic ties and traffic connections between Europe and China are in history noted as the Silk Roads, and they were not only used for the exchange of people and products, but also for something much more important the exchange of information, ideas and philosophies. With small interruptions, both the land and the maritime silk roads were flourishing during the centuries, thus enabling the movement of countless caravans and ships between the west and the east. It was a steady decline of the Chinese Empire and the so-called Great Power Game for Asia by Russian and British empires during the 19th century which practically sealed off the interconnection between the land and the maritime silk roads and disabled land communication between China and Europe. This inability to access Europe by land continued through the 20th century mostly due to two world wars, the Cold War and later due to political instability of the countries along the way. After the Chinese reform and opening up to the outside world, which was a big deal back in 1970s, China became absolute economic miracle. From 1978 to 2012, after relocation from agriculture to industrial production, China became second largest economy and first manufacturing and exporting economy on the planet. Today, among trading partners, Europe has the highest share in Chinese exports. In addition, according to data from Eurostat, in 2019, the amount of trade between the EU and Asian countries was about 560 billion euros, which is about 1.5 billion each single day. However, due to underdeveloped land connectivity with its neighboring countries, China still heavily relies on ocean routes for its international trade. The main ocean trading route between China and Europe starts in the ports of eastern China, passing through the South China Sea, the Strait of Malacca, the Indian Ocean, the Red Sea and the Mediterranean, arriving Europe after more than 20,000 kilometers. This trading route is greatly dependent on the Strait of Malacca, a well-known traffic bottleneck with heavy traffic flows, also known as being the region of unstable political situation. Consequently, because of this and some other problems, China has for a long time been worried about the reliability of this route in terms of potential blockages and territorial disputes. Among other political and economic reasons, with the aim to reduce the impact of existing transportation barriers and to improve its international trading efficiency, especially for European market, Chinese government launched one global and ambitious project called the Belt and Road Initiative. This initiative, also known as One Belt, One Road, is a global infrastructure development strategy that was adopted by Chinese government back in 2013. 
The name Belt and Road is also not a coincidence. Belt in this case should refer to the overland routes, i.e. the roads and the railways, which together form the so-called Silk Road economic belt. At the same time, the word road should refer to the sea routes or the so-called 21st century maritime Silk Road. This means that China has the intention to integrate Eurasian continent by developing quality transport infrastructure and simultaneously conquering the ocean by investing in ports and capacities in those ports. In essence, Belt and Road Initiative is China's intention to create or better said support the development of unique and multidimensional Eurasian transport network. This network is consisting of railway lines, roads, airlines, sea routes, but it also includes oil and gas pipelines, transmission lines and communication networks. It is very important to underline that beside being the base for infrastructure connectivity, BRI, which is short for Belt and Road Initiative, also have some other key dimensions crucial for its understanding. BRI is a political initiative supposed to help China to create new trade links and markets, but it also should enhance capital flows, improve cooperation and boost China's influence over the other nations. If you wonder how is China implementing these goals in practice, we recommend you to check out some other great videos that are dealing with this topic from a geopolitical point of view. We will put our proposals into description. Now, let's say a few words about the geography of Belt and Road Corridors. According to documents published by Chinese National Development and Reform Commission, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Commerce, the BRI includes six major land corridors within the Silk Road Economic Belt and one maritime corridor referred to as the 21st Century Maritime Silk Road. First Eurasian Land Bridge or China-Mongolia-Russia Economic Corridor Based around the integration of the existing Chinese-Mongolian and Russian regional development strategies, this corridor is intended to strengthen cross-border road and rail links between them, but in reality it also includes a route going through Kazakhstan. Then we have New Eurasian Land Bridge Economic Corridor. This corridor's backbone is a railway line that officially connects the provinces of Jiangsu and Xinjiang in western parts of China with the port of Rotterdam in Netherlands. But in fact it also serves coastal Chinese cities and many other European hubs. It stretches through Kazakhstan, Russia, Belarus and the EU. China Central Asia Western Asia Economic Corridor a land corridor linking Xinjiang province in China with the Central Asian Rail Network, i.e. the Arabian Peninsula and the Mediterranean coast. It passes through the five Central Asian and one Middle Eastern country. Those are Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan and Iran. It practically ends on the doorstep of Europe in Turkey. China Indochina Peninsula Economic Corridor a land corridor linking southern China with Singapore intended to sustain development of countries along the Mekong River through transnational road, rail and airport projects. Bangladesh-China-India-Myanmar Economic Corridor A land corridor linking southern China with India. China-Pakistan Economic Corridor a land corridor that links China's Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region with Pakistan's deep water port of Gwadar. This corridor includes several road and rail infrastructure projects, but also some oil and gas pipelines and telecommunication networks. And finally, there is the Maritime Corridor, which, as we said, links major ports of South China Sea with the Mediterranean Sea across the Bay of Bengal. East African coast and Suez Canal, but also ports in the countries along the way are included, creating the web of maritime corridors of, let's say, regional character. This corridor currently includes more than 30 ports. To understand how ambitious this initiative is, but also what are its potentials, it's enough to say only one fact. There are more than 65 countries involved in BRI in different ways, 
and they together account for more than 60% of global GDP and 30% of the world's population. It's important to mention that this initiative not only includes Europe and Asia, but also countries from almost all continents, especially Africa where China is already heavily involved in many transport and infrastructure projects. Now, if you agree, it is a right time to put our focus only to rail transport. The time it takes to transport goods between China and Europe depends on the mode of transport. By air it takes 5 to 9 days, by rail 15 to 19 and by sea 37 to 50. As you might guess, besides being the fastest, air traffic is the most expensive solution. Sea transport on the other side is the cheapest but also the slowest solution. Railways in that sense lies in the middle. But in addition, compared with maritime transport, rail transport has one small advantage. It is particularly attractive for the regions of western China because they are located far from the sea ports. Anyway, Belt and Road Initiative recognizes two main railway routes between Asia and Europe. The first one is China-Mongolia-Russia Economic Corridor, better known as the First Eurasian Land Bridge, and the second one is New Eurasian Land Bridge. It might be interesting to mention that even before the BRI was officially announced, China Railway Express trains were established in order to check market potential and enhance connectivity with the markets in Central Asia and Europe. This rail service operated between China and Europe based on the principles of full-time operation, fixed trains, routes and schedules. After several years of tests and attempts to select the most suitable routes, in 2011, the first regular connections from China to Europe were established on the routes of Chengdu Lodge, Chongqing Duisburg and Chengzhou Hamburg. The main aim of these services was to serve global producers from electronic and automotive industries, which have recently relocated their businesses from the coastal parts of China to central and western parts, mostly due to rising labor costs on the east. After the BRI was formally announced, the first Eurasian land bridge was officially formed. It consists of several alternative branches that all start in the far east of the Asian continent, only to merge in wide-gauge Trans-Siberian Railway in Russia. The first segment of this corridor includes rail lines which start in China and run through Kazakhstan and Russia. The second one is a connection between the cities of Hong Kong, Shanghai and Beijing, and the countries of Mongolia and Russia. The third section starts on the Far East and goes through Zabaikalsk region in order to also join Trans-Siberian Railway. After Yekaterinburg, goods are transported straight to the EU via Belarus. On the way, two transshipments are necessary because of the difference in track gauge. The first one on the Chinese border with neighboring countries and the second one near the city of Brest on the border between Belarus and Poland. On the other side, New Eurasian Land Bridge or the Central Corridor is the railway corridor which of course starts in China and goes through the territories of Kazakhstan and Russian Federation but on the route different than in case of the first Eurasian Land Bridge. From Almaty it goes straight to the city of Moscow, after which it reaches Brest. After Brest, some of the trains are directed all the way to Western Europe, to France or Spain. In fact, New Eurasian Land Bridge is an umbrella term comprising multiple links between for example Chongqing in China and Duisburg in Germany, or Chengdu and Lodz in Poland. Now when we are familiar with geography, let's get to the point. The reason why is this important and why we are even speaking about BRI is the fact that in less than a decade from 2011 to 2018 the number of trains between China and Europe have been increased about 370 times. In 2011 there were only 17 trains for the whole year, while in 2011 there were 17 trains per day. That growth continued in 2019 and 2020 as well, 
with the number of trains in 2019 being about 8,225 or 23 trains per day. In addition to this increase in total number of trains, there has also been a significant improvement in trade balance between China and Europe. As you can see on the screen, during the first three years not a single train was organized back from Europe to China. This means that over time, Europe has recognized the potential of these railway services but also the overall potential of the Chinese market. Ok, we mentioned the increased number of trains but we did not mention the increasing number of transported goods. It is in fact a controversial and delicate matter and you're about to find out why. Freight trains running from China to the EU were directly subsidized by Chinese local governments. The average subsidy per trip for a 20-foot container was between $3,500 and $4,000, depending on the local government. For example, Chinese cities of Wuhan and Chengzhou offered almost $30 million in subsidies every year to cargo companies. Without these subsidies, it would cost around $9,000 to send a 20-foot container by railway, compared to $5,000 which is the price with subsidies. Besides shorter delivery time, this lower cost of rail freight services is the actual reason why trains became competitive with cargo ships. But it's not that easy. Because of the chance to get more subsidies and boost their visibility under the BRI, Chinese transport companies tend to exaggerate their trip numbers. The competition between for example Chongqing and Chengdu, the two nearby cities, was so fierce that the two cities would refuse to merge cargo loads back from Germany despite neither being able to form a whole train on their own. When the pressure and reward to be the top service company facilitating Belt and Road trips becomes huge, companies simply start loading empty containers to their trains. In the most extreme case, one train carried 40 empty containers and only one loaded all the way to Europe in order to take subsidies, but also for these marketing purposes. This makes the China Railway Express impressive growth highly suspicious and most certainly a bubble. However, the Ministry of Finance of China is reportedly determined to pierce the bubble by enforcing a schedule for phased subsidy reduction. The plan was to cut the subsidies down to no more than 40% of routes total cost in 2019 30% in 2020 and zero by 2022. The ministry is hoping that by 2022 the trains running between China and Europe would become completely market-oriented. These announcements are in line with the initial plan of Chinese government to make Eurasian rail traffic being able to stand on its own feet. In addition, in 2018, Chinese government decided to enforce a restriction that only fully loaded trains can depart China to the west. This means that a train consisting of 40 fully loaded containers and only one empty would not be subsidized anymore. As a result of these measures, already in the first half of 2019, seven Chinese cities that handle more than 73% of all China-Europe cargo trains reported a loaded container ratio of over 94%. This indicates that the goal to reduce the number of empty containers departing China and finally to force BRI corridors to become market-oriented is at least on a good way to be achieved. As you might guess, there are many obstacles that affect the attractiveness and the market potential of railway traffic along the Belt and Road corridors. Maybe the most significant are infrastructure bottlenecks and the lack of technical and regulatory harmonization between the railway systems along the way. Together they result in high costs of operation and longer travel times. Also unlike the maritime traffic, Railways are dealing with the existence of different rules, track gauges and signaling systems, but also with political instability of certain regions and at the end different languages and cultures. However, the goods and the potential are here. But for the major improvement, few more things need to be done. In our opinion, crucial thing here is the approach of more centralized management of railway corridors. 
we will only mention the case of Trans-European Railway Network, in which each corridor has its own management and executive boards in charge for making the strategy and vision for that particular corridor. They are also in charge for planning and managing investments, facilitating interstate coordination directed towards harmonization of rules and procedures, and finally they act as some sort of contact point between the customers and railway companies. We're not saying it is going to happen in present geopolitical situation, but we are certain that only this approach would really result in connecting the West and the East by railways. For the end, if you like this topic and you want more videos in which we would explain some other aspects of Belt and Road Initiative, feel free to send us your proposals in the comments below. Also, don't forget to like this video and to share it with your rail-loving friends. Thank you very much for your attention, we hope you enjoyed and learned something new about the railways of the world. Goodbye.